So this probably isn't a super popular opinion, but I am going to say it anyway. And it's this. Pretty much nothing good has come out of the Tennessee legislature debacle in the past few weeks. Now, that is especially the case if you're someone like me who cares a lot about conflict resolution, who cares a lot about problem solving and mutual gains negotiation, who cares a lot about combating polarization, and frankly, who cares a lot about democracy and the future of this country. The tragic murder of six people at Covenant School in Nashville on March 27th was just another in a string of mass shootings in the United States since the start of this year. Now, one might have thought that something like this might provide an opportunity for folks in the Tennessee House of Representatives to come together for once, to put aside partisan politics for just a bit and maybe reach at least a little bit of common ground on the problem of guns in America. Now, it is just a simple fact that most people, including the people who support the Second Amendment and gun rights, also support at least some common sense regulation of guns. It is also the case that most Americans also care a lot about increasing support for mental health care in the United States. Despite the coming together, at least on viewpoints on these issues, what transpired in the Tennessee House of Representatives in the days following this tragic massacre is just an incredibly sad example of what happens when positions trump interests and when power gets used in zero sum ways. It enrages emotions it heightens polarization, and in the end becomes a media feeding frenzy spectacle. What is really sad about this is that none of this is inevitable. What happened instead is that all the voices on all the sides got way louder. And what could have been an example of people coming together in tragedy to do something good turned into the worst kind of damaging power contest one that has gripped the nation and, frankly, has gripped the world. So today, I'm going to recount the events in the Tennessee legislature that have become fuel for the partisan wars in this country and that have become high drama for cable news channels and social media trolls. I'm then going to describe the danger that this turn of events represents and discuss how a different approach could yield really different results. And if you stay to the end, I will offer you some advice on what you can do to avoid contributing to conflict spirals that only end in violence and despair. I'm Bob Wardone. I'm a senior fellow at Harvard Law School. I'm the founder and former director of Harvard Law School's Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program. And I'm the founder and principal of the Cambridge Negotiation Institute. Let's go. So it all started when two Democratic lawmakers in the Tennessee House of Representatives, that's Representative Justin Jones and Representative Justin Pearson, along with Representative Gloria Johnson, broke the rules of the Tennessee House of Representatives by using a bullhorn to join with proponents of gun control in the House chamber. They disrupted the proceedings by using the bullhorn and yelling, no action, no peace. This then led to a move by the Tennessee House, which is overwhelmingly controlled by Republicans, to oust the three democratically elected legislators from the House. Now, in fact, the Speaker of the Tennessee House of Representatives actually compared these three lawmakers to the rioters on Capitol Hill on January 6th. In what the New York Times described as, quote, a deeply personal, angry, and at times condescending debate, unquote, the House ultimately voted to expel two of the three people, Representative Jones and Representative Pearson, both black men. Representative Johnson, a white woman, 
Her motion to be expelled failed by a single vote. This expulsion marked the first time that multiple Tennessee legislatures were ousted from the House in a single legislative session since 1866, when Tennessee was struggling to adopt citizenship rights for formerly enslaved people after the Civil War. So this turn of events actually drew in national leaders like President Biden and Vice President Harris, who actually traveled to Tennessee last Friday to meet with the three leaders. So as is usually the case, when one side tries to silence or vanquish the other side by a showing of power, the opposing side responds in kind, finding its own sources of power. And that is exactly what happened here, because soon students and advocates of gun control rallied behind the two ousted lawmakers. And in fact, last Monday, the Metropolitan Nashville Council unanimously voted to reappoint Representative Jones to his seat. And then on Wednesday, the Shelby County Board of Commissioners also voted unanimously to return Representative Pearson to his seat. In fact, all seven Democrats voted in favor and the four Republicans just didn't show up to the vote. Now, along the way, cable news folks and folks on Twitter and TikTok, they have feasted and fueled on this vitriol. In fact, a Fox News video actually mocked Representative Pearson's transformation from a Bowdoin College student trying to bridge divides to what they called a Black Panther-like person who spoke like a preacher. The news article actually called him a fraud and said it was, quote, like an SNL skit. Now, fact of the matter is that on all sides, this has come to feel like it's a battle for democracy and for justice and for law and order and for the Constitution and for really basic rights. And I have to be honest with you, I confess to having my own strong emotional reaction to these events, feelings of defeat and then feelings of victory. Mainstream media hasn't helped because they've covered these events in the legislature in the most unnuanced, zero-sum, good-meets-evil sort of way. And most of us, like myself, at least for a moment, we have taken the bait. But guess what? It turns out this is actually not a competitive sports event. And it turns out this is not, it cannot be, a battle like the battle between the Rebel Alliance and the dark side. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and the traitor. Take it away! And the goal here just cannot be vanquishing the enemy. And that's because when there are 30 or 40% of the people on the other side of the issue, the notion that you can vanquish them just doesn't make sense. And in this case, whether it's immigration, or guns, or healthcare, or climate, the goal cannot be vanquishing. The goal must be to find ways to work with each other across lines of difference. The goal must be to identify common ground and to work from there to enact, believe this or not, wise policies that protect people, that preserve our rights, and that frankly contribute to the common good. And what happened in the Tennessee legislature, and sadly, what is continuing to happen in our country and frankly in many state legislatures, is exactly the opposite. It's exactly what happens when people try to resolve their conflicts by using power and rights talk instead of focusing on interests. So what do I mean by that? Well, using power is basically using your leverage, your ability because of your authority or your numbers or your strength or your weapons to force the other side to say or do something. But as the main way to resolve our conflicts, when we simply focus on power and rights, what we end up with is zero sum outcomes. What we end up with is winners and losers. And even worse, we never actually address or solve the real problems. And so if we could find a way to talk about our interests, what are the underlying needs, concerns, goals, desires, and fears, the things that really matter to us, if we could find a way to talk about them instead of resorting to power and rights, in many respects, we would find common ground and we could work out solutions. They might not be perfect, 
but they would move us forward productively and at much, much lower cost. How could we rewind this event? How can we go back and end up in a different place? I want to start by looking at the demonstration that the three legislatures first did on the floor of the Tennessee House. No action, no peace! No action, no peace! So was this demonstration, the use of the bullhorn specifically, a violation of House rules? Answer, it was. It's also worth noting that no one, including the legislators themselves, dispute this. So the question here is what should be the repercussion for breaking these rules? Now, in a normal time that wasn't super fractionated and super polarized, it seems to me that from a conflict resolution perspective, we have all sorts of possibilities. Let me suggest the first one, the one that would have been most lovely and most beautiful. And that's creating some space where folks could actually offer an apology and get some kind of forgiveness and acknowledgement, right? Imagine if the three Democrats felt like they could have come together and said, hey, listen, tempers were high. We feel so strongly about these issues and we felt like we needed to draw attention to them. We also respect the rules of the House and we're sorry that we broke the rule in this case. And what if Republicans could have said, you know, thank you for that apology. It is really important that we follow the rules in this chamber in order to ensure our democracy works. And we also really appreciate that you feel strongly about this and that the events that happened in our state at the Covenant School are extremely painful and affect people very, very differently. Imagine if that could have happened. What an example that could have been. Now, is this completely ridiculous? I don't think so. I think things like this could happen, and it is what leadership could look like. Obviously, that didn't happen, and it didn't happen, at least in part because of this highly polarized environment in which we find ourselves. We find ourselves in a place where the consequence of an apology might mean being canceled or being pilloried by your own side. And by the way, this happens on both sides. Right on the left, the apology might be viewed as weak or as an accommodation to power and to privilege. On the right, accepting the apology or creating a space for the apology might be seen as acceding to wokeness or not making maximal use of the leverage you have in the moment. And this environment desperately needs to change. Now, some are probably saying, listen, Bob, apology and forgiveness are nice. But that still doesn't solve the problem that there was a bad precedent set here. So let me suggest a second, still more constructive way of dealing with this than simply expulsion. Because in most situations in our society, when someone violates rules, if there is a punishment, it's in a punishment that actually matches the infraction, that is calibrated to what the infraction is. And this did not happen here because in fact in the entire history of the tennessee house of representatives this was just the fourth time that anyone was expelled from the tennessee house and to be clear no member of the house was ever expelled for breaking decorum the other expulsions were reserved for things like people who committed a sexual offense or had taken a bribe or were a convicted felon now if the feeling was strong that it was important to enforce the rules some kind of a warning, maybe even a formal censure, might have been appropriate. But to go to the most extreme penalty simply escalates and makes this conflict worse. It contributes to a conflict spiral. Okay, let me give you a third possible way forward. A third possible way might have been to look to some outside person or entity Someone like a mediator, and just to be clear, I'm not suggesting actually a mediator, but somebody who could have created a space for the parties to come together and talk through what happened in a way that would have lowered the risk for each of them. So in conflict resolution, we sometimes call this a mediator. We could also imagine the use of something like a restorative circle, but in politics, it might look a little bit different. Consider this, some of you may remember during the Obama administration, that President Obama and then Vice President Biden invited an African-American Harvard University professor by the name of Henry Louis Gates and a white police officer from the city of Cambridge, the two of whom had gotten into a scuffle with each other 
um, that had a racial element to it. But the president and then vice president invited these two individuals to the White House for something that was called a beer summit. It was really a conversation. And what was nice about that is that the president and the vice president making this invitation created a, a space where this black man and this white man who had a very public conflict could feel like they could come together and actually talk and listen to each other. Now, it's so interesting to me to think about that that is how the White House reacted many years ago. This time, again, because of our polarization, the way the White House acts is an outrage and then sends the vice president to give an angry speech in Tennessee. Now, there are other ways, by the way, that we could create this lower risk space. So, for example, imagine some moderate Democrats and some moderate Republicans in the Tennessee House of Representatives getting together and saying, this is poisonous for us, for our reputations, for the good of the state. Let's see if we can create some kind of form or have some kind of conversation where we can invite some of the more extreme people in and again, make it safe for them to be a part of the conversation. Let me give you a third example. This is a real example. Some years ago in a local Massachusetts town, there was a vitriolic relationship between members of the board of selectmen. And the vitriol had gotten so bad that actually some selectmen had put toilets on the lawns of other selectmen overnight. What happened is that local clergy in that community across all sorts of faiths, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim, came together and they actually approached me and some of my colleagues and said, could you, under our sponsorship, create some space to bring these people together? And in fact, these selectmen came from different faith communities. They all did have active and lively membership in faith communities. And so the religious leaders were able to create this space that provided cover for the politicians to come together in, in conversation. So the point is, right, there are all sorts of ways that this situation that went from zero to 120 could actually have been an opportunity for de-escalation, for conversation, for something that could have brought us to real problem solving. So despite the events that happened in the Tennessee House of Representatives, I really believe that people can work together across lines of difference. You know, in my home state of Massachusetts, we just finished eight years of rule by a Republican governor with an overwhelmingly Democratic state legislature. Now, on many, many issues, the governor and the state legislature disagreed. It is also the case that they worked well together. They passed wise legislation. And in many respects, people in the state of Massachusetts on both sides of the aisle felt that that divided government actually worked for them. So it is possible, and I would just say it's the only way forward. Because if we continue along this path, of cancel, oust, expel, power, 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 and then rights to fight power, we're going to find ourselves in a ditch we can't get out of. So if you want to learn more about how you can address polarization in your own world more directly, I want to encourage you to watch this next video, which is called, Is There a Better Way to Talk About Hot Button Issues Such as Abortion, Guns, and LGBTQ Rights? Also, don't forget, before you leave, please like this video. And if you haven't already, I'd be grateful if you could subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to ring the bell so you don't miss new content. I'm Bob Wardone, and thanks for watching. Okay, you don't want to expel me. Keep watching.